Your bank studios. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan, and in for Amy this morning, Jeannie Ives, former state legislator, host of The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. That airs on Sunday evenings at 7 to 9, 7 to 9 p.m. on these airwaves. Uh, KJP, she's the White House spokeshuman. Karine Jean-Pierre was asked about the murder of that New York City police officer, Jonathan Diller. Uh, Trump will be attending Officer Diller's wake today, while Joe Biden, the big guy, Mr. 10%, uh, he attends a fundraiser at Radio City with Obama and Clinton. Hmm. Tale of two presidential candidates. Here's what uh, KJP had to say by way of offering condolences. President Biden is deeply grateful for the sacrifices police officers make to keep our community safe. Uh, this shooting is yet another painful reminder of the toll of gun violence, that what it's, what it's doing to inflict uh, on families and our communities and our nation. Uh, and that's why the president signed more than two dozen executive actions. That's why we're able to pass a bipartisan agreement to uh, deal with the gun violence that we're seeing in this country. Obviously, more more work needs to be done. We need Congress to continue to act uh, on making sure that our communities are safe. Uh, yeah, they're doing uh, bang up work in uh, improving public safety in major metropolitan areas in particular, not to mention now even outlying areas, thanks to the influx, the importation, the invitation of upwards of 10 million people to enter this country illegally. For more on this, we're pleased to be joined by John Lott, president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, former senior advisor for research and stats at the DOJ's Office of Legal Policy, author of books including Gun Control Myths and More Guns, Less Crime. John Lott, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Uh, how did you receive KJP's condolences slash touting of Biden administration accomplishments on public safety? <laughs> Well, you know, I wish they would kind of understand that the general notion for reducing violent crime is just to make it riskier for criminals to commit crime. You know, have prosecutors who are willing to bring cases against them, have, you know, higher arrest rates and have longer prison sentences. Uh, you know, the way you reduce gun violence is the same way you reduce violent crime generally, and that is you make it risky for criminals to go and commit crimes. Ninety-two percent of violent crime has no, absolutely nothing to do with guns. Uh, they want to focus on just the 8%. And I, unfortunately, I think a lot of the gun control laws that they actually push uh, are counterproductive. Uh, you have to be careful that the laws that you push are not going to primarily disarm law-abiding citizens. Because, look, just as you can make it risky for criminals to commit crime with higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates, and longer prison sentences, you can also make it riskier for them to commit crime by making it so that the potential victims are able to go and defend themselves. Well, uh, yeah, p potential victims going to uh, being able to defend themselves. Um, hmm. That brings us to uh, this uh, pronouncement from uh, DOJ head slash attorney general Merrick Garland. Uh, announcing the launch of the National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center. Catchy will uh, provide our partners across the country with valuable resources, that's in bold, so it's important, to keep firearms out of the hands of individuals who pose a threat to themselves or others. The National Extreme Risk Protection Order Resource Center. Are you excited about that? Uh, well, I don't think it's going to accomplish what they want. I mean, first of all, as, a, as an aside, uh, normally Congress has to pass a, a law creating a new agency. Uh, I guess, the, you know, I, I suppose it's not surprising that the Biden administration doesn't care if there's an actual law for something. But look, everybody wants to try to keep people who are dangerous from obtaining weapons. The, the point is, though, is that there are much better laws that are already on the books uh, in all 50 states and the federal government. It's called civil commitment. If you think somebody's a danger to themselves or others, you can call the police. The police will come out. If the police think that there's a, quote, reasonable chance, which is like a 20% probability that that's true, 
they can take the individual in for a mental health care evaluation. If the mental health care professionals agree that there's a reasonable chance, there can be an immediate hearing. If, uh, uh, if somebody can't afford a lawyer, one is provided for them. Uh, witnesses are cross-examined. And if the judge concludes that there, it is a reasonable, uh, that the person is a danger to themselves or others, the judge has a wide range of options. He can say, look, if you go to outpatient treatment, we'll reevaluate in a week or two. Uh, he could take away the person's driver's license if he thinks the person's likely to drive a car into a crowd of people, or he can take away their gun. Or in the most extreme case, he can involuntarily commit them. The thing with these red flag laws is the only thing that the judge has in front of them is a piece of paper with the complaint. He doesn't talk to the person who made the complaint. He doesn't talk to the person who the complaint is made about. And the only thing that the judge can do is to take away a person's gun. So, you know, most of the time these are used for concerns about suicide. Well, you know, if somebody's suicidal, is it really serious solution just to take away the person's guns? Is there like no other option that you have? I mean, look, in Chicago, uh, you had a handgun ban in effect for a while. Uh, it's true that uh, firearm suicides fell during that period of time. But what happened to total suicides? Total suicides remained unchanged. You know, so then, you know, the, the issue is there, aren't you going to take into account that there are other ways for somebody to go and commit suicide and people pretty easily switch between the different ways there? Isn't it the total number of suicides that you care about uh, changing? Uh, but they don't seem to matter. And, and, and here's the other thing. The, because there's no hearing, uh, these laws can be abused. I have a good friend of mine, uh, Andy Pollack, who lost his daughter at, uh, uh, in the Parkland school shooting. Mm -hmm. um, after that, he moved to rural Oregon to get away from kind of the memories in Florida there. Uh, he had a neighbor that moved in next door to him at the same time from California. The neighbor hated him politically and filed an extreme risk protection order against him. Uh, the judge, simply looking at the piece of paper, uh, took away Andy's guns. Um, when they eventually had the hearing, uh, the judge didn't even require that Andy had to put on a defense because the judge said, there's no threat here. Why did you file this piece of paper? And uh, But while Andy was been disarmed, Living in rural Oregon, a mountain lion uh, showed up outside his home. Uh, Andy would normally have a gun to protect himself there, but he w didn't have it there. His dog got into a fight with the mountain lion and was badly bald, had to have 50 stitches on uh, just one part of its side there. Um, and uh, But, you know, that shouldn't have happened because if there had been a hearing, uh, Andy's gun would never have been taken away to begin with. Well, I, you know, when I was in the state legislature, we they, they ran the red flag law in Illinois. And my right. whole view was it doesn't, doesn't really matter what law you put in place. If a family member or somebody close to somebody that they think is a problem here uh, might have, you know, a tendency to hurt themselves or others. I mean, if they don't speak up regardless, you're not going to – the red flag, red flag law is meaningless – and, and so it's incumbent upon, and, and if they do recognize it, it, they're going to speak up, but they're going to do something anyway to prevent that person from harming others, in my view. So they're not really well, effective unless the family and, and, you know, close friends are paying attention. Right. Well, I mean, these laws normally allow a wide range of people uh, in order to go to bring these uh, complaints. I mean, it can be a neighbor, it can be a friend. Uh, it doesn't have to be just a family member who's going to be doing this. And, you know, but the point is, is that if you're already concerned, there's already a law on the books in Illinois and all 50 states mm -hmm. that I think allows much uh, more options for the judge, allows people to go and get treatment. Uh, and, you know, if you think somebody's suicidal, you know, you want to get them some type of help. You just don't want to simply take away the gun. How is simply taking away the gun uh, the solution to the problem that's there? 
or homicidal. I mean, we have this case out of Rockford, I'm sure you heard about, where this individual stabbed and killed four people that seemed to be sort of a right. random stabbing spree. And the word is that he tried to check himself into first uh, Rosecrans, uh, uh, which has an inpatient mental health facility, and then Swedish American Hospital out Rockford Way, which also has a mental uh, health inpatient facility. And he was denied admittance in both places. Then he goes on this killing spree. Now, we don't have sort of the full details and police are saying we still, you know, they don't have a motive at this juncture. Um, but it sure s strikes me. Um, and that's a right. law enforcement source saying that it sure strikes me as this was a situation where somebody is deranged with violent tendencies and uh, there was some system failure. Right. Well, I mean, there's system failures, lots of places. And, you know, to me, part of the issue is what's your backup plan? You know, you look at mass public uh, murderers uh, in general and uh, over half in the last 25 years, over half of them were actually seeing mental health care professionals prior to their attacks. And yet in not one single case, did these mental health professionals uh, identify them as a danger to themselves or others. Uh, in fact, there's a whole academic literature about the inability for mental health care professionals to identify these individuals as a danger to themselves or others. Well, part of um, it is part, but part of that is a commentary on the mental health profession, which is an important part of the conversation. You know, it's not a bunch of. I mean, I, 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 you have to bring politics into this because it's a politicized profession. It's not a bunch of. Uh, conservatives in those psychiatric and psychological professions. It's uh, people of the left that are otherwise looking for opportunities to absolve people of individual responsibility for their conduct. And that disposition can inform that uh, a slowness on the uptake when somebody does pose a threat. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, and the reason that they give, maybe this is a rationalization, uh, given what you're saying, but uh, they'll say, look, take schizophrenia. There are about two and a half million Americans that have schizophrenia at any point in time. Uh, if you look over the last 25 years, there's been one, maybe two of these mass public shooters who uh, had schizophrenia. And so they say, look, if, even if you were to go and identify the thousand of the uh, 2.5 million uh, Americans with schizophrenia who are most likely to engage in this, even if even if you get one of the thousand there, you're going to be wrong 999 times. Well, uh, is well, well, n I, I disagree with that. I mean, Theodore Dalrymple makes this argument. Um, the former prison I'm just psychiatrist. That's the argument that they make. I'm just oh yeah, they the well right. Yeah, they make it, but but that's but that's a that's a silly argument because Theodore Dalrymple makes the point right. You, you, you it's not just schizophrenics or somebody with some other mental health. Uh, issue because you have to explain why people that are similarly situated don't commit violent crimes. I get that. It's right. a case by it's a case by case basis. That's the reality. It is a case by case basis, and you have to be, have people making judgment calls. That's just how it works. But um, but what I'm saying is uh, the judgment of that profession, generally speaking, that is dominated right. by the left, is uh, a judgment that is polluted by politics. Can, right. can I ask another question here real quick? Um, of course. So uh, Mayor Brandon decides to sue Glock because they, he says that they make guns that are too easy to be manipulated into automatic weapons. So this is another one of those, like, don't blame the perpetrator who's buying the illegal part, uh, which is mostly Chinese manufactured, by the way, which Sheriff Tom Dart flat out said he knows that it's coming from the Chinese. Uh, don't blame the Chinese. Don't blame the online seller don't blame the actual um, cr um criminal who's who's adjusting his glock to make it automatic no blame glock and now i guess 12 other states have joined this lawsuit or are thinking about doing it yeah it's just like kias are too easy to steal sue kia mm -hmm. right <clears throat> well yeah there are people that are suing uh uh car makers because they say that their cars are too easy to steal and so they're blaming them for the carjacking crimes you know of course the biden administration is not blaming china for supplying the raw materials for fentanyl and stuff like that too look uh you know the the problem that you have generally is it's difficult to stop criminals from going and getting guns of any type uh and you know, you, it's 
just about as difficult to stop them from getting guns as it is to stop them from getting illegal drugs. Uh, you know, drug gangs uh, are a huge problem uh, in terms of violent crime in, in Chicago. I don't think people realize what a percent, large percentage of uh, murders in Chicago or across the nation. You know, when they say over half the murders are acquaintance murders, they don't realize that most of those uh, involve rival gang members. It's very common for the members of one gang to know who the members of uh, other local gangs are that are there. And, you know, if you think you're going to be any more successful in stopping drug gangs from getting a hold of guns than you are in stopping them from getting a hold of uh, illegal drugs, good, good luck with that. Uh, as uh, we're uh, nearing the uh, takeover of uh, society by uh, robots and AI, um, what is um, uh, you did a little uh, thought experiment, like so many have, to see what kind of responses like Google's Gemini would um, would produce, uh, but on your topic of particular interest, and that is guns. And uh, what did you find? How how accurate, in your view, is Gemini and these other AI platforms? Uh, we we asked the 20 uh, AI chatbot uh, platforms uh, 16 questions. Nine of them dealt with crime generally. Seven of them dealt with gun control issues. And it was kind of stunning. Uh, you know, so the crime questions would be things like, do higher arrest rates and conviction rates uh, reduce crime? Uh, you know, does the death penalty deter crime? Does do voter ID laws uh, go and uh, make it more difficult to engage in vote fraud? Uh, do prosecutors who refuse to prosecute uh, criminals uh, affect the crime rate? And they were given an option, you know, anything from strongly disagree to disagree, neutral, agree, uh, to strongly agree. And uh, except for um, uh, Elon Musk's Grok, uh, all the American uh, chatbots uh, were very liberal on crime issues. Uh, the two worst were Facebook and uh, Google, Facebook's Llama and uh, uh, Google's Gemini that you just mentioned. And, you know, they not only would like disagree that higher arrest rates and higher conviction rates would lower crime, they would strongly disagree uh, on those categories. Um, and, you know, maybe it's just my training as an economist, but I think, you know, you make something more costly, people do less of it. The price of apples go up, people buy fewer apples. You make it riskier for criminals to go and commit crime with things like higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates, or longer prison sentences. You deter criminals from committing the crimes. But, you know, uh, things like Facebook and, and Google, which are the most prominently used uh, uh AI chatbots, uh, you know, they not only disagreed with that, but they strongly disagreed. They just, dis mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you know, and the thing is, uh, you kind of wonder, I mean, given Google's new searches, you know, people probably have a similar idea about how biased those are, because uh, obviously the left wing claims, you know, if you put in those questions into uh, Google, uh, you're going to get kind of certain sources which come out well to the left on those types of issues. Yeah, my polluted AI engineers, polluted AI. Uh, John Lott is the president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, former senior advisor for research and stats at the DOJ's Office of Legal Policy, author of books including Gun Control, Gun Control Myths, that is, and More Guns, Less Crime. John Lott, thank you as always for joining us. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Have a